Well, good morning. Am I, am I, can you hear me? Do I need to go up a little? Turn up a little? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to. Testing, testing. Is that better? All right. We're, we're, anyway, y'all, y'all know, y'all know. There's a, uh, there's a, a record label that on the records that they manufacture and send out, they have a gold sticker on it that says, we're trying our best. So that's, that's, what, that's what we all, whenever it comes to sound or anything like that, we're trying our best. So appreciate it, Harold. Thank you. Um, well, good morning. Good to see everyone with us. Glad you could be here as well. Uh, what beautiful weather we are having and gearing up to have a rather warm week. So uh, so I hope that you are prepared for that. Sojourners, are y'all here for one more week? Yeah, hope y'all are prepared for the warmer weather. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be uh, take some getting used to. Well, before we get started this morning, let's bow in a word of prayer. Our heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving. We thank you and we praise you for your love. We praise you for your perfection. We praise you in all that you are and all that you have done. We thank you, Father, that you have provided a way back to you through Jesus and through his cross. We praise you that he was not left in the tomb, but instead he came forth alive, that he could be the provider of life eternal for everyone who would come to him in faith and repentance. We ask, Father, that you would help us to remember each day our commitment, our covenant with you through him, that you have fulfilled your promise in not only giving us a new heart to serve you, but that you have given us a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell within us, to strengthen us, to bring us to a place to where we can perform the things that you would have us to perform. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen us each day as we see the world and the things going on in it. We know that there are so many things and so many ways that we have strayed from, from your will. And we pray that not just that the world would get back there, but that we would also focus on here at the local level, that we would be people who delight in your will, and Father, who would live that out through the strength that you have provided. We ask that you be with those of our number who are sick and who are, who are stressed and, and anxious in various ways. We know so many people facing illnesses. We know so many facing surgeries. We know so many facing even, even spiritual stress. And we pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and that we could be encouraging. And so as we come before you this morning and as we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive it and to understand it, to live it and to teach it to others so that the borders of your kingdom will continue to expand. Uh, Father, we would continue that we would grow as people who delight in your will. All these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We are in 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We saw in the last chapter that Samuel was sent to find, and he was led to Jesse, who, uh, from whom God was providing himself a king for his people. We saw that it was not in the the oldest sons, or it was not even uh, from from young or from oldest all the way down, but instead it was the youngest that God had chosen. And so David was anointed king, but this was not something that was made public. This is not something that uh, that is is immediately rushed into. But we are going to find that when David's, uh, when God's choice in David is made known, that there is going to be uh, some some feelings toward that, which we will be getting to in the next chapter. But here in chapter seventeen, uh, we find, or we were left off with, David in some way being 
being found in Saul's service, and that is that God, uh, God sent a, a spirit, a, a troublesome spirit on Saul. Whether this was something that was sent directly by God, some people have described it as, as um, Saul's feeling of inadequacy because God has rejected him. Either way, we find that Saul wanted this feeling of rejection or this troublesome feeling to, to, be, uh, to subside. And so it was eventually found that David was in his service to play music for him whenever this spirit would trouble him. We don't know how long David was in his service, but, but it seems that once we get to chapter 17, it seems like maybe... David's portion in that uh, was finished, and so he was dismissed from that. Because we find him instead being in the service of his father, uh, taking supplies back and forth to his brothers. But we find here, we're going to go rather quickly through the first part of this narrative, um, just because there is so much here, and because this is one of the more famous stories in Scripture, we probably, we probably know it pretty well, but I encourage you to go back and to read through the, the whole of the narrative. But we're just going to hit some of the highlights here at the beginning. What we find in verses 1 through 3 is the situation that is going on is that the Philistines have occupied Soko, about 14 miles west of Bethlehem. So the Philistines are pressing in a little bit close, and they are actually in Israel's territory. And so Israel goes to meet them uh, on the other side of a ravine, the Valley of Elah. So the Philistines are on one side, and Israel encamps on the opposite side of them. So the two armies are kind of facing one another with this valley in between them. And we are introduced to Goliath which we probably all know, whether we've gone to church our entire lives or whether this is our first day sitting in here, chances are we've heard of David and Goliath. And we get a rather lengthy description, even though it, uh, it takes a few verses. It's a pretty lengthy description of Goliath himself. Uh, look there in verses 4 through 10. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. So we're given this pretty lengthy description, and there are some things that we should note about the information we have of Goliath. Depending on your translation, I think most would agree where it talks about his height there, being six cubits and a span. Now, one of the most famous things about Goliath is his height. He, he's known as or described as a giant. Well, if we take the six cubits and a span, that equals nine feet nine inches, which is rather tall. But there is a, another measurement that is sometimes given of four cubits and a span. And this comes from different places. Uh, one of those places, I believe, is the Septuagint. Another is uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. These texts would give four cubits in a span, which would equal six feet nine inches, which is still pretty tall. So depending on, uh, depending on however ta or how tall he was... He was tall, he was formidable, he was strong. And we find there with his armor in verses 5 through 7, it says that he had a bronze helmet, he had a coat made of bronze, and the coat of mail that we see there uh, weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which would equal 125 pounds. 
And that's a lot of weight to carry around. I don't even think uh, our soldiers and the armed forces carry around that much. But this, again, lends itself to the strength that Goliath had. And his spearhead, the weight of that is given. This, the head of his spear weighed about 15 to 16 pounds. So you're talking about a big man who's able to carry a lot of weight and who's able to wield weapons that no normal person would be able to wield. You're talking about someone who is tremendous in his strength and is probably very intimidating. But we also see here the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines have a lot of pride in Goliath. And Goliath probably has a lot of pride in himself. Because instead of the two armies going head to head with, with all of their soldiers to see, like in a traditional battle, who was going to overcome the other, we find in verses 8 through 10, we see that Goliath makes a proposal. Verses 8 through 10 says, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. We see this play out in, in cinematic depictions, not just of David and Goliath, uh, but, but a lot of times in, in any scenario of war, there is one that comes forth and challenges the strongest from the other army essentially to a duel. And so Goliath's proposal is, defeat me, kill me, and you win. I mean, that seems like a pretty simple exercise. But then we get Israel's response. Especially this, notice what Goliath says there. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? There's one thing about Israel that the surrounding nations should know. It is not really who the king is who sits on the physical throne of Israel. It should be who Israel's God is. Goliath is not threatened whatsoever by Saul. And he is not threatened whatsoever about these servants of Saul. Goliath is very confident. And here we see Israel's response there in verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. We've seen Israel in this sort of situation before, and normally what happens is whether it's Samuel or even whether it's Saul that we've seen, steps forward and says, why should we be afraid? Remember who we have on our side. Remember who we serve. Remember who brought us out of Egypt from slavery. But we don't see that anymore. Now instead, what we see is not just the troops, but we see Saul himself dismayed and greatly afraid. Which now brings us to this ultimate point and this question, what does this say about Saul's leadership now? That Saul is just kind of standing there, not sure what to do. God rejected his lineage. God rejected him as king. And at least from what we find in the text, not so much for what we find, but what we don't find too, maybe it was the case that Saul implored God, but we don't get that indication. But then we find there in verse 12, Now David. 
The, the narrative switches. The focus is now drawn from this battle scene that is going on and this proposal from this formidable enemy to now David. Well, what is it that we know about David? We were introduced to him in chapter 16. We're again introduced to him once again in chapter 17. David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse. Well, we knew that. Who had eight sons. We knew that as well. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul into battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistines came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And so we find here that David is charged with bringing supplies back and forth from his father's house to his brothers at the battle. Verse 17, And Jesse said to David his son, Take, your, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment uh, as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard them. And we go, Going into verse 24 uh, is where we're, we're really going to pick up and start to look closely at what is going on here. But I want us to notice something interesting. We're introduced to David. We know who David is. We know who he's going to be. We know what his lineage is going to produce or who his lineage is going to produce. But have you noticed something interesting about David in the story so far from chapter 16 and even now to chapter 17? I know you're probably thinking, well, Jack, I have no idea what you're talking about, and that's okay because I'm going to tell you. David hasn't spoken a word. We didn't even know who David was at the start. We weren't even told his name until later on in chapter 16. And here, so far, he's been anointed already as king by Samuel. God has chosen him. And in the story, we haven't heard a word from him. But that's all about to change once we get to verse 26. We look there in verse 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that is Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So anyone who will volunteer to step up and defeat the Goliath and defeats him will receive these rewards. Will become rich. Will get to marry the king's daughter. And from from what people consider there, will make his father's house free in Israel. That his family will be exempt most likely from paying any sort of tax. He'll be free. And David said to the men who stood by him, and hear the first words of David, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. We notice that David asks this question. He, he sees this Goliath. He hears this threat and this proposal. And so he asks the men, what's going to happen to the one? What is the king going to do for the one who kills him? And the men tell him. But we notice David's concern. David's concerned about two things here. That there is reproach toward Israel and there is defiance of the armies of the living God. And I would propose that we are going to continue to see David's concern throughout this story. And I would say that the whole point of this story is not to see in how many ways we are like David. But instead, it's to be concerned for the same things that David was concerned for. We've probably heard this story told so many different ways and preached in, in, in so many different ways. And a lot of times it's preached or taught as an allegory. I'm not saying that the people who preach it and teach it don't believe it to be literal, but, but too many times we allegorize this story. We look at it and we say, well, what are the Goliaths in your life? How can you be a better David to the Goliaths that are troubling you? And that completely misses the entirety of the point of the things that David is concerned about and the things that David points to. And I would even say that the point of the story isn't necessarily, although we find it here, isn't necessarily David's faith. It's the one in whom David has faith. This story is not about the strength of men. It's not about the strength of David's faith. It's about the strength of the one in whom Israel should glory. And we are going to find out exactly how God defeats the enemy. And so we find here that David is concerned at the fact that this, phil this uncircumcised Philistine is bringing a reproach and defying the name of the living God. And so we find there in verse 28, Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when, David, uh, when he spoke to the men. So Eliab hears that David is, is asking all of these questions and finding out all of these different things, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And so now Eliab starts charging David with all of these things. Well, why are you even here in the first place? The typical older brother behavior, I suppose. Why are you here? Why have you abandoned your responsibility with the sheep back at home? And he says, I know why you're really here. You just want to see the battle. And Eliab actually pronounces evil against David's intentions. You just want, you just want to be here for the battle, and that's not a very noble thing. David gives a typical youngest brother response. And David said, well, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? I'm just asking questions. I'm just talking with the soldiers. David could probably even say, and this is just this is my own sort of observation, David, David could say, I'm finding out about the situation. I'm doing a whole lot more than y'all are. I don't think David was that arrogant or he was that rude. But David's like, I'm just, I'm just asking questions. And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. 
David is making sure that the things that he's finding out and the questions that he's asking, he's getting a consistent answer from everybody. And so we find that David here, David is concerned about what he sees. And he's finding out what is going to become of the one who actually defeats this enemy. Well, now we find there in verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David is brought before the king. David says, I'll do it. Don't don't really know what how much confidence David has. We we don't really know what his level of confidence is, but we are once again going to find out David's chief concern with with the reproach toward Israel and with the defiance of the armies of the living God. David feels confident that he can go and defeat this Philistine. And Saul said to David, are you, not, you are not able to go against the Philistine and fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war, of war from his youth. Saul's skepticism of this whole situation is front and center. But you know, Saul missed something that Samuel was let in on. Back in chapter 16 and verse 7, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And here we see that is exactly what David is doing and Saul has failed to realize. He says, let no man's heart fail because of him. But I will go. Your servant will go and and fight with the Philistine. And Saul is looking at in all the wrong places and in all the wrong directions. Yeah, but David, you're young. You're inexperienced. You know, this Goliath, we look and we see the type of man that he is and we know that he has been a man of war from his youth. But David is going to kind of put Saul in his place. He says there in verse 34, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. We know that about David. He was a shepherd. That's how we were introduced to David. He was out in the fields tending to the sheep. Don't we kind of think that that's a pretty simple job? Especially when we think of shepherding today. I mean, the, the sheep are kept inside a field that is fenced in. We really don't have to mind them or tend to them very much. We go out and check on them every so often, and we bring them in, and we send them out. But as far as shepherding today is concerned, it is a pretty easy job. But David's about to put Saul in his place, and he says, I may be young, and and what I do in tending the sheep may be seen in, in a mocking way from his eldest brother, but we see... I used to keep sheep for my father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. We don't really think about bears or lions when we think about keeping sheep. We we think about wolves or coyotes Coyotes more for this area. But here we see that David was facing something a whole lot more terrifying than the things that we face today, keeping sheep, at least in this part of the world. David would go, and if there was a lion or a bear that came and snatched up one of their sheep, he would chase after it, and he would strike it and deliver the lamb out of its mouth. And we see there that it it gets even worse. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. 
Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David says his reproach against Israel and his defiance of the living God should not stand. This, this is not the way that it should be. David's ready to fight. David's ready to go and to take care of the situation. And he looks at Saul and he says, I'm not inexperienced, at least not the way that you think. No, for, every, for all the strength that Goliath has, David has defeated things that are at least as strong, if not stronger. Things that are only acting on instinct and things that only have one thing on their mind. Things that are not ruled by arrogance. David says, I can defeat them. I can defeat him. Verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And so we find that Saul's skepticism is met with David's confidence. And we find here, once again, both David's concern that the reproach of the Philistines should not stand, that should not stand as long as Saul has allowed it to. But also we see David's faith. We see that as God has delivered him from the bear and the lion, so he is confident that he's going to deliver him from the Philistine and deliver Goliath into his hand. And so we find there that Saul clothed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of bronze and on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped a sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. So now we have David, no armor, no sword, nothing according to men that you would need in order to effectively enter a battle. And so he approaches the Philistine, and in verse 41, the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. You know, a good-looking face is not really the face of a battle. You want someone who is older. You want someone who is experienced. You want someone who has seen battle and has come out on the other side victorious. That's the person that you want to send for. Your biggest and your best, not a scrawny little youth with a handsome face. And Goliath actually takes offense to this. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Goliath says, I'm going to make quick work of you. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. 
And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. Well, Goliath can smack talk, but David can do just the same. Except David says that my, my trust and my faith is not in swords or spears, it's not in armor, and it's not in shields. Instead, I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. And we see that David's confidence is in God and God alone. And what we find here in verse 48 is that when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. I remember quite some years ago, y'all remember pay-per-view? Probably haven't thought of that and I don't know how long. Pay-per-view was a big thing. And... Um, Pay-per-view, one of the big uh, attractions to it was when they would have certain sporting events. And, and a lot of times, now these sporting events, they cost upwards of $60 to $70 a pop just to be able to have access to it, to watch it. I remember my dad wanted to invite some people over, and there was a Mike Tyson fight that was on pay-per-view. And you think for $60 to $70... This is going to be just, a, and I don't even remember who Mike Tyson was fighting, uh, but this is going to be, you know, just back and forth. This is going to take up the whole time. Hopefully it goes into round after round, only to build to this climax. And you say, man, I got my money's worth. Well, the fight starts, and the two go at each other, and Mike Tyson knocks the man out in about two minutes. 60 to 70 dollars to watch this fight that ended in two minutes. And let me tell you, my dad was mad, as any of us would be. It was anticlimactic. You should have seen it coming, but how could anybody have known? You know, we expect this, this, this battle that's about to take place between this giant and a youth with no armor, no sword, no spear, no shield, just a sling and a rock. You would think that this is going to be just a huge battle. And as popular as the story of David and Goliath is, it's over as soon as it begins. We see there, David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Over just like that. Struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the ground from Shariam, as far as Gath and Ekron. The people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines. They plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. The strength and stature of a six to nine foot tall Philistine against a youth who did nothing but trusted in the Lord who saved His people time and time again. That was what was David was concerned about. 
How can we allow this Philistine to reproach Israel, to reproach and defy the name of God? And as Paul said to the Corinthians, if somebody comes and preaches a different Jesus, or they preach a different gospel, or they, they give you a different spirit, or tell you about a different spirit than the one you received, as Paul said to the Corinthians, you put up with it readily enough. And how often is it that we put up with the reproach of the name of God today? Not just from other people, but even committing that very sin ourselves. Are we concerned with the name of God? A name that is holy. A name that is above every name. And the name of Jesus, which is above every name. A name that at the end of all things, every knee is going to bow to. See, David's concern for the holiness of God should be our concern today. No, we don't go up against those who reproach the name of God with a, with a stone and hit Him over the head but it's still something that we should be mindful of. It's something that we should be concerned about. And it's something that we should be concerned about that when we hear others reproach the name of God, we should be strengthened to live in honor of that name. But we are going to continue on with this next week. My encouragement to you is to continue on into chapter 18 as we meet together next week to look and we see not only David and Jonathan's friendship, but then we see the beginning of Saul's jealousy toward David and what he's going to do about that. I appreciate your time, your attention, and we will pick up there next week. Thank you.